Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Johanna Kaba, the Communications Manager at the Coleridge Initiative. Thank you for your continued support of the Coleridge Initiative and MDRC. Our goal with this webinar session is to provide you with information on the program and on the letter of intensive mission process for the State Impact Collaborative. We are excited about this opportunity and look forward to working with interested states. Our speakers for today are Jessica Cunningham, Vice President of State Programs at the Coleridge Initiative, Richard Hendra, Director of MDRC, the Center for Data Insights, and Melissa Wavelet, Senior Fellow at MDRC Post-Secondary Education. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them in the Q&A chat and we will do our best to answer them towards the end of the presentation. The recording for this session, along with additional materials like the PowerPoint slides, will be shared within a week or two. With that said, please welcome our first speaker, Melissa. Thanks, Johanna. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. If uh, you are further east, uh, I am in Madison, Wisconsin, and it's a beautiful day. I hope you're all enjoying your summer. Uh, to get a sense of who is in the room, we invite you to put your name and your state agency or city or county or a, uh, university that you are associated with. So we get a sense of the breadth of participants across the country. Just as Johanna mentioned, we are here today to provide information about a new project that we would like you to consider applying for. So a few key things. One, it's new, brand new. It sounds familiar. It will do some similar things to other projects, but this is a new effort with private philanthropic funding to support efforts to conduct a rigorous evaluation to learn what works to promote economic mobility in your state. So new project, two years long, you get to work with MDRC and Coleridge to conduct a rigorous evaluation to promote economic mobility. Those are the five takeaways. So next slide. So I will continue on the project overview, what the benefits are, and then Rick will speak about who is eligible to apply and participate, the nature of the evaluations, the tests that we'd like to work with you on, and what type of data uh, we will use together, the types of activities you'll receive, including the applied data analytics training and access and work within the administrative data research facility. And then we'll talk about the timeline and Jessica will close us out with next steps and we'll have time for a Q&A. Okay, next slide. Okay, so IMPACT, uh, it is an acronym. It's an acronym that stands for Innovative Models for Policy Acceleration and Collaborative Testing. So collaborative testing means just that, conducting evaluations and tests together in order to accelerate policy and learning. Oh, we will get the chat uh, enabled so you can join. Sorry about that. So this isn't testing for the sake of testing. This is testing to learn and to generate evidence so that we have evidence-based learning that can inform practice, decision-making, policy, uh, and program improvement. And we will do this by working alongside you and by providing funding. So if you aren't familiar with our two organizations, uh, Coleridge and MDRC have a history of working together um, over more than, more than uh, five years, and most recently on the TANF Data Innovation Project and currently on the TANF Data Collaborative 2.0. So if you are interested in either of those projects, uh, Johanna will put a video into the chat so you don't have to listen to what I say about how we work together, but you can hear from agencies that worked with us in the TANF Data Innovation Pilot and hear what they say about working together with us. But Coleridge, um, specifically brings an amazing applied data analytics training that has been available and taught um, more than a thousand people already across the country. That is part of what Coleridge brings expertise in delivering that training and access to what's called the ADRF, the, which is a data integration and analysis platform. Remember the acronym uh, but know that it is a place for us to work together on data that is ingested into that cloud space that we can conduct the evaluations together. 
MDRC brings a long history of evaluation and research. In fact, 50 years. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary in 2024. So we haven't seen an evaluation yet that has stumped us or has uh, discouraged us. We've uh, seen it all and uh, are ready to overcome barriers and challenges and opportunities with, um, with the four sites that we will select through this process. So we are a seasoned team, have worked together and look forward to working um, with, uh, with agencies in this, uh, in this project. So next slide. Okay, so I've said some of this already, but just to be clear, what are the benefits for uh, those of you who participate and are selected? One, uh, we talked about accelerated learning through testing, providing funding. Exactly, uh, what I mean exactly is up to $75,000 per year for each year, so uh, for the two years. $75,000 is not going to enable you to create a new program and then test it. It will enable you to offset staff costs and costs for attending activities and attending in-person conferences. Third, you'll get increased capacity to conduct data science, analytics, and evaluation. So that is, again, where MDRC and Coleridge does a great job bringing forward our skills to work with you through this, and then collaboration. Next slide. So this is a list of the benefits uh, as well as activities. So two tracks, what's important to know that we know that not everyone is already in the ADRF. So because of that, we will have two tracks. One track is for agencies that are already in the Administrative Data Research Facility, this cloud-based platform. And another track will be for states, agencies that want to get in and want to work with us to do that in this two-year period. So those two tracks are distinct. However, the experience what you will be doing may differ based on where you are in that data acquisition, but what you will get from our team is the same. A dedicated coach, access to national experts, the hands-on training through the applied data analytics course, as well as training on evaluation, instructional webinars on a wide range of topics, annual cross-site convenings starting with January of 2025, um, actually, it, this will start in January 2025, but the first convening will be in March of 2025, and then tools and templates. Now I'll pass the mic to Rick. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Rick Kendra from MDRC, and I'm also so excited uh, to join you today to talk about this awesome initiative to, to work together um, with you to build evidence. Um, these collaboratives like the TANF Data Collaborative and other work we've done with Coleridge have been so successful and energizing. Um, we learn a ton from them and we hope you do too. And it's just really amazing to be able to work on one that is squarely focused on evidence building. So um, as Melissa noted, um, the State Impact Collaborative is about learning what works to promote economic mobility. So we're looking for state agencies who are committed to using research and evaluation to advance economic mobility among individuals and families with low incomes. Um, we're casting a wide net. So um, you can see on the slide here that you know, proposed tests must target interventions and policies in one of several broad areas. These could be in workforce, higher ed, income support, housing, or justice programs. Um, we know and um, are excited. We have lots of different um, entities on today's call, including cities and counties, and you are absolutely welcome to apply. Um, because our initiative is focused on having statewide impacts, we would just ask that all teams should have at least one state level staffer on a team. This could be someone from the state to help with data access. It could be someone from the state to help with policy, dissemination. So if you're a county or city and interested, by all means, you're, you're welcome to apply just to make sure to have a state person on the team. Next slide, please. As um, Melissa noted, one of the really exciting benefits of participating in this initiative is that you're going to build up your capacity as an agency to do evaluations. So in order to exercise those muscles, we want to have a focus on evaluations that are feasible within the two-year timeframe of this initiative. 
You'll find in the application materials a checklist which highlights what we're looking for in terms of the kinds of interventions that are suitable for what we call rapid cycle testing. So what do we mean by that? So interventions should have measurable outcomes, that is clear, quantifiable outcomes that can be measured quickly and accurately. They should have short implementation windows. So programs um, should be implementable within a few weeks or months and something that can be evaluated within the time frame of the initiative. They should be feasible. We're looking for interventions that are practical to implement uh, within the constraints of the program or organization. So that would include having the authority to make these programmatic changes. Uh, the data should be available now. Um, so we'll not have time to secure access to new data sources within this time frame. So you should have um, data access now. It, interventions should be low risk to participants. We wanna make sure to do ethical testing, usually of incremental changes. Now rest assured that we're gonna have an institutional review board that's gonna review all of these tests just to make sure they abide by all human subject standards. You also wanna make sure to have stakeholder support from leaders, program staff, and participants. And we wanna test interventions that have clear hypotheses because the goal here is to generate evidence for the field. So we wanna have generalizable research findings and we're gonna um, be sure to work with you to help refine um, your, your testing ideas to make sure that they're gonna address gaps in the research literature. Next slide, please. Okay, so what kinds of programs are we talking about here? Well, um, a range of programs. You know, we think that a lot of these projects, um, you know, given the sort of uh, criteria I mentioned earlier, a lot of them are probably gonna involve testing one approach to a program or policy head to head against another approach. So many tests are possible though. And these examples are just intended to give you a sense of the range. We're not trying to steer you towards any given test. Um, and we have a lot more examples in the application materials. But for example, you might test two different approaches to intake head to head. So testing two different intake methods to see which was more effective and encouraging enrollment and participation in a program. For example, maybe one approach might focus on program benefits and the other approach might focus on supportive services that are available. For that kind of test, you'd probably wanna have some kind of program tracking data. Or in another context, suppose you're looking at a study focused on health and well-being. In that case, you might test two different methods for providing nutritional counseling to program participants. In that case, you might use SNAP data or Medicaid data. Um, another example would be you might be testing two different approaches to coaching techniques to improve program retention, um, you know, comparing it to existing approaches. You might test inducements to get people to participate, like gift cards or stipends, um, to encourage people to go to job training sessions, for example. Um, they could be more ambitious as well. Um, for example, there's a lot of interest in AI right now. You might test an AI chatbot to increase take up of the earned income tax credit. Um, or you could test an AI approach to career navigation. Our only caution in cases like that would be if you're gonna test some kind of newish technology, make sure that it's already developed and ready to go because we're not gonna have time in this intervention to test out something that's totally experimental and might not work in a real world context. You'll notice that in all the examples I mentioned here, we really are thinking about different kinds of administrative data. So that's a big emphasis in this initiative. We don't think survey data are gonna be um, very effective in, given um, the kinds of questions we're asking and the kinds of timeframes we have in, in mind here. So many other tests are possible as long as they meet those broad criteria that I mentioned in that checklist. Um, again, check the appendix for more examples, use your creativity. Our bottom line here is we want to make sure you propose tests that are important to your agency that have the prospect of promoting upward mobility for your citizens and that meet the conditions described above. Next slide, please. So we mentioned evaluation. What kind of evaluations are we talking about here? Well, first we wanna acknowledge that the prospect of doing a rigorous evaluation might seem a little intimidating at first. 
And we recognize for some of you, this may be the first rigorous evaluation you're taking on. For others, you may be old hands at this. We wanna assure you that we are here to help you both in terms of design and implementation of these evaluations. Um, you'll be working with a team that has a combined century plus of experience um, designing and implementing evaluations in the real world. Uh, as Melissa said, we've seen it all and um, we're here to train and support you every step of the way. So remember that this initiative is set up to build your capacity so that after we're gone, you can do more tests like this. We do not assume that you have everything in place to do this now. Our coaches and our technical bench are gonna be with you every step of the way. So that's the first point that this is about learning how to do evaluations, but what kinds of evaluations? Well, we do want these evaluations to influence policy. So we wanna have high quality evaluations because we wanna have strong research designs that give strong evidence that could actually lead to change, right? So that's why we do have a preference for random assignment evaluations. But remember that RCTs, randomized control trials, do not have to involve the denial of services to a control group. We think that many of the tests, and you can see that from the examples that I provided, are more of what we'd call an A-B test, which means comparing one approach to another approach, one approach to delivering services to another approach to delivering services. And even though um, you know, I'm from MDRC and we love random assignment, we are also open to other research designs. Um, so if you propose um, other designs, just please be specific about the approach, but matching designs, time series, you know, there's all sorts of designs out there, synthetic controls, regression discontinuity. If those terms are new to you, you are in the right place because we're gonna be learning what those kinds of terms mean as part of this project. Um, we'll help you find the strongest feasible design for your problem and we'll help you implement it and also to analyze the data that comes out of it. As part of the applied data analytics training that Jessica is going to talk about, you'll learn about the data analysis concepts and approaches unique to program evaluation. Next slide, please. So our goal is to put your data to work for evidence building. We know that um, data access can take a long time. So we ask that you focus on data that you already have access to. In your application, please describe the data that you need for your analysis and whether you have access to all of it and the permissions necessary for analytical use. At a minimum, the data needs to include the key inputs and outcomes for your evaluation, things like enrollment, participation, activity data, but also the outcomes. So if you're proposing an employment study, you'd wanna have access to employment and wage data. If you're doing an education intervention, make sure that the education data would be available to address your research questions. After the state agencies are selected, a data sharing agreement will be established between each state agency and the Coleridge Initiative. As Melissa mentioned, but I wanna underscore, you do not have to presently have your data in the administrative data research facility, but in order to conduct the analysis together, eventually you will have to have your data in the ADRF for this initiative. And Jessica, I know in her comments, will be talking a little bit more about what the administrative data research facility is. And with that, Jessica, over to you. Great. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I'm going to echo what Melissa and Rick ha have said. I'm excited to be here with you and excited about this new uh, collaborative project that we have with MDRC. But as Melissa mentioned, this is a new project, but this is not a new partnership between Rick, uh, or between Rick, Melissa, the organization MDRC and Coleridge. So due to that, we have used kind of our experience and our partnership to think through some of our recommendations for your teaming um, composition. So first of all, uh, we recommend that you have a team coordinator, somebody who's going to serve as your point of contact throughout the life cycle of the project. Um, someone um, on your team should be an administrative leader, so somebody who has the authority to make decisions and commitments um, related to the project that you are proposing. And then finally, we recommend interdisciplinary teams that will participate in the applied data analytics training. And what we mean by that is we know this is a data project, but based on our experience, we recommend 
interdisciplinary teams as a part of the applied data analytics training and the data analysis portion of this project to mimic how this happens in practice. So in other words, for this reason, in addition to a data analyst or research analyst on your team, you will also want to include um, representatives like a policy expert to help you with questions that are going to be relevant to policy. You may want to include a program coordinator that has deep knowledge of the program administration and maybe um, how the data are collected. And then finally, you may want to include executive leadership, um, someone that could help think through communicating the results to a broader audience and maybe help champion maybe policy or programmatic changes that um, you may want to, to shepherd through as a result of your findings of this project. If you are a local team, these respective roles, we recommend the same type of roles at the local level, um, with the exception of, as Rick mentioned, uh, interdisciplinary member being a state staffer. So next, I want to discuss, as Melissa mentioned, the two kind of components from the Coleridge Initiative side of this partnership that are key components of this collaborative the applied data analytics training, and the administrative data research facility. So from here on out, I will reference those as the ADA training and the ADRF. So sorry for the alphabet soup. The applied data analytics training, um, as Melissa mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, we were excited to, as of 2024, hit that thousand total participant mark of people who have uh, been trained through this um, ADA training. And so your inter the, the interdisciplinary teams as a part of this project will go through an applied data analytics training using real state administrative data on methods critical to the projects that you're proposing as a part of this. You'll notice on this slide that we've had a ton of experience across a large variety of um, domains, and a lot of those focus areas are inclusive of the ones that are a part of this project. The second component that is critical to this, so the applied data analytics training is actually hosted and administered inside the administrative data research facility. So I'm not gonna go too far into the technical details of what the ADRF is, I'll keep it pretty high level for today, but if you need a further deep dive into the, the technology infrastructure itself, please do reach out. We're happy to do a demonstration or talk to any of your IT folks. Um, but this is a secure FabRAMP authorized cloud-based cloud platform. We currently house over 500 confidential governmental data sets across 50 different um, levels of government. And we use this, uh, the ADRF as a platform in which you can link both within your state across the agencies, but then also across state lines um, to securely link that data. And then also to collaboratively, collaboratively work with coaches like you will in this project or other researchers that are external researchers outside of your agency um, on projects that you authorize the use itself. So as a part of, to kind of conclude uh, the component of the ADRF, the ADRF is where the, the ADA training is administered, and then you will be hosting um, data for your state uh, impact collaborative project in the ADRF and working with the coaches um, to work through your project itself. Uh, we also employ the five SAFE framework, and so we do this so that you as a governmental agency can maintain full governance and um, over your data with the highest standard of security protocols. These five states include projects, people, settings, data, and exports. So the projects that happen with your data are only the ones that you approve as an agency. We have the ability to isolate workspaces so that however you govern your projects within the ADRF, that is up to your governance. Safe people, only trained and authorized users are allowed to work inside the ADRF. So authorized users are agency approved users, people that you say can have access to these data for specific purposes. 
And then we have a specific um, onboarding process in which we train how to securely work uh, and maintain all of the FebRAMP requirements as an authorized user of that data. Settings, so secure transfer methods. And then we only are an upload operations only. So um, while we do work through the ADA training and on some other projects with states and things like that, we only do so when we're authorized to do so. So really just ingesting the ADRF is an operations only. And then outside of that, it's your environment and you maintain the governance of that. The safe data itself, we hash, we use a hashing application that hashes the data on the state agency side prior to ingesting into the ADRF. So no PII um, is requested for you to, we can securely link that data with through the hashed um, GUID and do not need to use PII. We also have a data stewardship model where you as an agency authority can manage and monitor all use of your data while it's in the ADRF. And then finally, safe exports. So we both do a non-disclosive review, both on the Coleridge side and then your agency data steward side. We have a log of all the exports for auditing purposes. So in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is, <laughs> you know, our number one priority is that we are providing secure ways for you as an agency to maintain government governance and link and collaborative collaboratively build capacity for using your data for impact. So on the next slide, last but certainly not least, we'll finally get to the timeline. <laughs> um, this is just a high level timeline of kind of uh, where we are going and the upcom upcoming important dates for this collaborative engagement. One, you've probably already seen the release because you're here. Um, the uh, letters of intent are due August the 7th. We will then select state agencies to be invited for a virtual interview in September. By the end of that month, we will select states and teams to submit a full proposal, which will be due on the highlighted date on this slide, October the 18th. We will make our selections by the end of December, so the end of this calendar year. And then we will start the new year off right uh, by kicking off this exciting uh, state impact collaborative with state teams in January. And then finally, our first kickoff meeting, as Melissa mentioned, uh, will be at in conjunction with the Coleridge Initiative's annual convening in March. So with that, I think we'll open it up to our question and answer session. Jessica, there have been a couple of questions coming in about the ADRF, um, one from Josh Hawley, an ADRF agreement often takes a while to put together. You might describe the range of time it takes states to sign one and if there are costs to states. Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, it definitely does take time. So um, that's why we are putting a pretty long runway in terms of the states that are coming on board that may be new states and don't have data in the ADRF already, that they will be able to have that runway of, say, six to eight months to work on an ADRF um, agreement uh, while we kind of do the applied data analytics training and some of the pre-work to that. And there will be no costs um, for the ADRF services. Um, it is all covered as a part of this project itself. And then another question from Mandy Paradis are, um, what if any commitments might our agency be assenting to related to the ADRF? So I um, may need clarification on exactly what you mean by that, but as I mentioned, uh, what you are doing is you are signing on to whatever your specific project is that you are trying to accomplish and what the data are that are related 
to that specific project. So as a part, we will work through a data sharing agreement and host that particular data that is relevant to this project. In that data sharing agreement, we will outline things like it's only gonna be used for the state impact collaborative, um, if that's what you choose as an agency, and that's completely fine. And here is the life cycle. This is when the project will end. Here are the data stewards, and here are the authorized users from your agency. And then, of course, um, whoever your coaches might be uh, as a part of this collaborative itself. But you have absolutely no commitments outside of this particular collaborative to engage in the ADRF whatsoever. Um, and then there is a, one more, well, another question about whether there's an informational video on the ADRF or other resource to help us inform our agency about it. We can, in our follow-up um, materials, when we send out the this uh, recording and um, the PowerPoint itself, we can send one of our recordings from our webinars that um, dealt with the ADRF and some of the intricacies of it and a demo itself. So we can share that with you. And as I mentioned, we can also meet with any state teams individually that would like to learn more or invite your colleagues to learn more about the ADRF to feel more comfortable about um, this secure platform and um, collaborating with this environment. Um, and then another question about the ADRF, what happens to data post-project? Is the data relinquished back to the agency or does it stay in the ADRF? We actually have a data destruction policy, which we work through those details um, when we do the data sharing agreements. And we will provide a certificate of uh, destruction if that's if you so choose. You also will have the ability to continue um, that uh, agreement before the destru destruction policy um, is enacted, but then you can also export any code, um, any of the exporting, uh, any results or statistical output from the project prior to the end um, of the the data, the project itself that's outlined in the data sharing agreement. Great. Maybe I'll give Jessica a little bit of a break here and uh, maybe recap some of the questions that we've been answering online. Um, so one question came in, if, if a recent model or change was piloted and data were collected, may an entity apply for this opportunity to do a rigorous evaluation of the impacts and implementation of the pilot, so long as the work and data fits the scope of interest? Um, and Rick said, absolutely, that would be welcomed. I don't know if you want to expand on that at all, Rick, or. Um... Yeah, we. Um, it's very common um, for, for us at MDRC to evaluate just exactly in that mode. Like after there, there's often a, um, a pilot study, sometimes we call it a formative evaluation before we would do a more rigorous evaluation just to make sure the program is um, operating at a steady state that it's a, you know, there's a prospect for a good test. So I would say that's ideal because then it, it means that the intervention is more ready to go and ready to test. So that's a really good example of what we're looking for. Um, and another question that was answered in the chat, um, are only RCTs, randomized controlled trials considered, or could one apply to do a quasi-experimental evaluation of a program that was implemented recently, and we said quasi-experimental designs are welcome. Um, another question that came in, when you say local agencies, would it be ideal uh, for it to be the municipality or could another nonprofit organization apply with a state representative engaged? Um, and the response was the team should be led by a government agency. All right, let's see. Um, another question that has come up are our coaches evaluators. Melissa, do you want to take that one? Sure. So, yes, coaches will be uh, either data scientists from Coleridge or evaluator researcher staff from MDRC. So, depending on the nature of the test, the domain of uh, the policy area, 
uh, in which the test is taking place, whether it's higher ed or criminal justice or workforce development. Um, we have uh, deep benches behind us that we can draw on uh, for our coaches. And so it will be a curated match. Um, uh, and the short answer is yes, folks with uh, evaluation expertise and data science expertise. Great. Um, there was another question that um, came in about, do you have any published past evaluations that you can share? Um, Rick responded, uh, there are links to shorter term evaluations in the application packet appendix for longer term evaluations. Um, he also uh, gave a link. I don't know if you wanna say anything more about that, Rick. Yeah, the um, there are a lot of links in the appendix. Um, we wanted to look at evaluations that have been conducted successfully within a similar time frame as we're talking about now. Um, so those are, um, you know, good examples. Um, we, the one I shared, the caution there is that is an evaluation that took about five years. So I don't, I don't want to, it's a good example of an evaluation, but, um, sort of a more comprehensive one. So I would say that the, the examples that are in the application appendix are, are probably better to look at. Okay, one question <clears throat> just came in. Does this opportunity include research, publishing, coaching, or working with Coleridge and MDRC to publish or present the findings? Why don't, um, Melissa, do you wanna take that one? Sure, so during this two year period, I don't anticipate us getting to that point in a formal way. Um, informally, there'll be webinars and uh, time spent on thinking about who to present to, create a, um, create a stakeholder briefing plan or sort of a dissemination plan. Um, we would like to publish, know that that would be something that we would encourage if we can support it, we could. We just recognize that two years may not be enough time for that, but we are in favor of supporting that. And um, if that's an interest of a particular interest of the selected agencies, we can provide um, coaching and instructional content in the webinar on that topic. Yeah, I'll just add that the um, part of our um, technical assistance, um, similar to TANF Data Collaborative, we, we go through the whole process, how to use the data, how to analyze the data in an evaluation, and um, part of the technical assistance we'll provide is how to write about the data and how to present the data. So um, we are very much uh, interested in helping you to get these results out because the goal here is to drive evidence-driven policy and change through research. So it's important to get the findings out there. So we'll uh, work with you on that. Does anyone else want to kind of <clears throat> jump jump in on any of the responses that have already been given? I would just say that um, in terms of the, there was a question about other kinds of designs. Um, so we, we are definitely welcome to quasi-experimental designs. We have a bit of a preference for random assignment if possible, but if you, if you do propose a quasi-experimental design, um, it's welcome and just please um, provide a little bit of um, information about um, the, the validity of the design and how you'll make sure that the results are rigorous. Are there any other questions? Oh, one other question just came in. Um, if an entity has more than one concept, would we submit them both in the same application or separately? 
I would suggest um, submitting them both in the same application. Um, that that's great if you're considering a couple of different ideas. Um, and you know, please just uh, make sure to hit all the uh, questions for both of them, including the what you're testing, what data would be used, etc. Okay, I think this um, wraps up our informational webinar for today. This is the address where you can email both questions and the letter of interest before August 7th. If you have questions, uh, more come to you after today, after you sign off today, no problem. We are posting questions in an FAQ um, every Friday on the same website that's listed here. Um, the application guide, the letter of interest, and the FAQ will be updated every Friday. If there are no questions in, in the course of any week, the FAQ won't be updated. It'll just reflect the prior week. So um, we'll probably take the questions from today and put those in the FAQ as well. So um, the end of this week, um, the webinar questions will be reflected in the FAQ. Um, but that's the best place to continue to return to. And we have that, um, and we have all the information that we covered today. Uh, if you missed that, we will be sharing the recording and the PowerPoint deck as well. So that will also be available.